Welcome back to the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This is Chapter 6, The Deep Holism of Science. I would be properly regarded as a crackpot if my philosophical explorations did not rest upon a solid scientific foundation. It is no longer appropriate for a philosopher like me to simply make logical assertions about human minds and behaviors with the implication that you should just take my word for it. It is important that the foundations of my assertions about human psychology are grounded in scientific facts, so that my philosophical assertions can be built up from there. Scientific facts do not exist independent of each other and the world in which they are appropriately applied. In order to properly appreciate the role of science, we need to explore the context in which its assertions about reality will make sense. A scientific grounding is especially important when my philosophical assertions are likely to challenge your intuitions and long-held beliefs about yourself, a career you have been called to serve, and people you care about. In order to change the system effectively, we need both practical and logical understandings of the hidden curriculum. But before we can geek out on the technical details of the hidden curriculum, we need to take a detour through the holistic approach to schooling. In essence, holism is about how a whole and its parts relate to each other. But what does that have to do with education? It's trivially obvious that a student is part of a school, but which whole matters? The whole child or the whole school? Schools that are regarded as traditional sometimes treat students as willful individuals in need of strict training in order to overcome their childishness. This leads believers in this idea to organize their institution of school in a certain way. Traditional in the education world typically means teacher-centric and conservative. Other schools have been said to be treating students as inherently good souls who have a natural curiosity to master the world if that curiosity and other virtuous characteristics are actively cultivated. These folks can be referred to as romantics, who also recognize that through institutional neglect or active corruption, students could become evil too. The romantics blame the traditional schools for causing bad outcomes for too many students. They regard traditional schools as inherently corrupt because they are an example of a self-fulfilling prophecy that generates the vicious characteristics it is intended to avoid, with the negative effects of the stereotype threat mentioned in Chapter 3 being but one example. The primary concern for both of these models is for the whole school and how it serves the purposes of society. Holism, properly understood, is a rejection of both these premises as too narrowly focused on how schools shape individual students. But there are both shallow and deep versions of holism. On the surface level, holism takes a broader or more encompassing view of the individual served by the school institution. From this shallow view, for instance, a child is observed to have not only a head, but also hands and a heart. Academics are regarded as a head-engaging intellectual activity. The stereotypical image of schools that emphasize test scores and getting into college are criticized for being too exclusively focused on the head. A better educational experience for students is the focus of this brand of holism. Students are acknowledged to have heads, hearts, and hands that all need to be trained or cultivated. A holistic educator in this sense might advocate for more practical experiences that engage them in doing handiwork and address the heart by adding social-emotional skills to the curriculum. Another potentially shallow approach could be to throw in the term spiritual. The term spiritual might just serve as a shorthand to encompass adding hand and heart activities, but spirituality might also mean adding religious instruction and some religious rituals into students' school days. Some Waldorf and Catholic schools, for instance, may claim the title of holistic on the basis that their curriculum is supposed to address both spiritual and intellectual development. 
This is often expressed as a concern for the whole child. It is a shallow take on holism as long as other holes, such as the school, the society, the planet, etc., are neglected. In order to draw on what I consider to be a deeper notion of holism, the idea of a school must extend beyond the development of the individual student and take into account how the whole of the school institution not only shapes, but is shaped by the individuals that make it up. Deeply holistic schools expect to be influenced by their students. They recognize that wholes and parts are mutually interdependent. So the influence goes both ways, though it is obviously stronger going from the whole group to the individual part. Holism is a view that recognizes that parts and wholes are inseparable. Any separation we might talk about is merely an imaginative intellectual exercise, not an accurate reflection of reality. The wholes that matter are students and the school and the society and the ecologies and so on. The underlying assumption is that both every whole and every part we happen to identify are simultaneously wholes and parts. If we can label all wholes and parts as systems, then we can begin to figure out what all the systems have in common. In order to talk productively about holism, we have to talk about how systems work. And in our discussion of systems, we need to distinguish the central causal dynamics from the froth of various other salient, peripheral, and non-causal events or processes that happen. We need to distinguish the sound and fury signifying nothing from the rub that actually matters. I believe that science is the best gauge of the causal nature of reality that we have available. Physics, chemistry, and biology are each fields of study that deal with a somewhat distinct level of causality within our holistic reality. Given that those fields of science are interdependent by definition, it strikes me that some form of deeper holism is unavoidable within science. A holistic perspective is necessary to appreciate how the fields relate to each other. For instance, chemistry deals with atoms and molecules. If a biologist wants to understand how the cells that make up an organism operate, she has to work within the constraints of how chemists understand the workings of molecules. A doctor is essentially an applied biologist, and so the doctor is just as constrained by the principles of chemistry as any regular biologist. Applying this to schooling. Psychology is the relevant scientific field for dealing with educational causality. Educators are essentially applied psychologists and must work within the constraints of psychology, which must work within the constraints of biology, which is constrained by chemistry, all of which are constrained by the fundamental principles of physics. This is important because by separating out the most central causal elements in education from peripheral or unrelated elements, we can be much more effective at achieving our educative aims. At the most basic level in education, we are concerned with enabling individuals to perceive accurately, think clearly, and act effectively on self-selected goals and aspirations that are appropriate to their situation as they manage their mental maps of reality without necessarily being consciously aware that they are doing any of those particular things. In this definition, the phrase appropriate to their situation carries the most significant burden for educators. Using this kind of holistic approach charges us with the obligation to put the situation at the center of our educative concern in two different ways. First, remember that the behavior of the whole group emerges out of the interactions among the individual parts that make it up. This is a basic principle of holism. Therefore, a holistic view of human situations implies that the central defining causal feature is the way that participants govern their own and other members' behavior. Second, holistic educators must also consider how the individuals to be educated 
come to understand their situation as participants within six types of groupings. One, as a bodily assemblage of cells. Two, as a psychological assemblage of minds. Three, in relationship dyads. Four, in organizations. Five, in societies. And six, in ecologies. Human behaviors at these six scales have impact on both immediate and long-term well-being for the person taking the action and potentially for many others. Cognitive scientists have found that morality is fundamentally about well-being. Therefore, causal impact on those six levels affect well-being, giving those decisions moral weight. Having that scope of potential impact on well-being defines the human moral universe. If we do not understand the nature of the moral universe in which we exist, then we cannot take appropriate actions to protect and promote the well-being of ourselves and everyone else we care about. Any individual who misunderstands their situation is one who is at a severe disadvantage as they attempt to generate appropriate behaviors. By definition, a misconception about their situation is going to increase the chances that they will be guided to enact inappropriate behaviors. Of course, all of us are always at this kind of disadvantage to some degree, but learning deeply over time, such that someone would qualify to be called educated, is the key to getting better and better at making good, morally defensible decisions. We have monumental difficulties understanding the power of situations because our day-to-day -day understandings of how we live and act in the world make it seem like we have a lot more power to be in touch with reality than we really do. We like to think that we each have a stable and consistent personality that determines our behavior with regard to every situation. And we intuitively suppose each situation to be a reality delivered directly to us by our senses. We do not like to think that our personality changes every time we enter a different situation, or that what our senses deliver to us is an impoverished and severely incomplete shadow of a hidden reality. However, decades of careful cognitive, scientific, and psychological research forces us to those conclusions. Holism might seem to introduce a lot of unnecessary complications if you think that it entails keeping track of everything going on at all levels at all times, because that would be crazy-making. The key to a practical holistic approach is to focus on the leverage points at lower levels that cause things to happen at higher levels. Consider how the same principle applies in other fields. The secret to energy abundance is to respect the principles of physics that enable us to understand and harness energy possibilities that exist at the atomic level. Albert Einstein's sole Nobel Prize was awarded for his explanation of the photoelectric effect. It was his explanation that opened the way to both lasers and the use of solar energy as a practical alternative to fossil fuels. Einstein's insights into relativity were instrumental in the development of nuclear energy, which is way more efficient than either fossil fuels or solar if you ignore the issues of cleaning up and storing nuclear waste. Viable alternatives to fossil fuel energy use the leverage of that lower level of atoms and their subatomic particles to power the much higher levels at which we live. Similarly, the psychological framework of self-determination theory has revealed that there are leverage points underlying the learning process that can enable the higher level of instruction to become far more effective and efficient. The psychological leverage points for education are the four elements of primary psychological need satisfaction, sleep, relatedness, autonomy, and competence. The first half of my online lecture course, Defense Against the Dark Arts, called Motivation Hacks, is focused on that form of psychological leverage. In short, 
by supporting the satisfaction of those four needs consistently, educators will maximize their positive influence on the learners in their care. Leveraging the psychology of learning in order to maximize the educational effectiveness of schooling requires a four-part process that I call a recipe for holistic equity. Inspired by the consensus definition of equity recently provided by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, the recipe is as follows. 1. Define needs scientifically. 2. Distribute resources fairly to satisfy needs. 3. Remove structural barriers to need satisfaction. And 4. Satisfy needs with parity across groups. The Academy's definition of equity, slightly modified, is embedded in numbers 2, 3, and 4. Looking at that first step, what does it mean to define needs scientifically? The SDT community has been studying this for decades. In my view of that body of research, there are four key types of needs. Primary, secondary, particular, and derivative. The primary and secondary needs are universal to all humans, while the particular needs are specific to individuals, groups, or situations. Derivative needs are what you arrive at if you mix and match all the other needs. You can think about it like an alphabet where the needs are the letters. There are a lot more technical details about how that works, which I explore in Appendix 3. You will recall that there are three scientifically credible primary psychological needs, related to autonomy and competence, that may not be as well known as the other five primary needs. Supporting needs is the most basic building block of achieving equity in addition to being the key to successfully navigating against the wind of ignorance. There is at least one published list of teacher behaviors that have been studied for their motivational effects on students. That list includes 57 typical classroom behaviors and the effect sizes range from about negative three to positive two. I suggest that we think about the actions that we take to support needs in two ways as basic mimetic engineering and educational hygiene. Let's talk about hygiene starting in the next paragraph. You can explore the possibilities of mimetic engineering in Appendix 3. I have put off that discussion due to a combination of its technical nature and the relative incompleteness of my thoughts about it. Medical practices were horrifically ineffective back in the 1800s. It was significantly safer to have babies or set broken bones at home rather than risk a visit to the local infirmary due to the odds of becoming infected simply by being treated by a doctor. Back in the mid-1800s, society was navigating epidemic diseases using the idea that bad smells, called miasma, were causing those diseases. This included related ideas about the necessity of balancing humors in the body, which were conceived of as internal vapors. If your internal vapors became unbalanced, then you were supposedly susceptible to the infiltration of the toxic miasmatic vapors from outside. These ideas led to tragically disastrous medical strategies, such as universally applying bleeding, cupping, and purging as humor balancing treatments for nearly any disease. In public health, it led to the Water Board of London in 1848 ordering raw sewage to be dumped into the Thames River, the drinking water source for over two-thirds of the city. That decision killed tens of thousands of people in 1854 because it contributed to the worst outbreak of cholera the world has ever seen. They had the best of intentions because they were fighting the miasmatic stench that arose from the raw sewage that was previously accumulating in the streets. From our modern perspective, we can see that miasma theory was a major cultural source of medical and public health errors that led to bad outcomes. Most important to my point is that there was scientifically credible evidence that certain hygiene practices could significantly cut down those errors. In 1847, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis had solid data proving that postpartum maternal deaths at his teaching hospital were cut by more than half by 
by the simple hygienic practice of washing hands. I turn now to the book Noise, A Flaw in Human Judgment by Daniel Kahneman, Oliver Saboni, and Cass Sunstein to elaborate on hygiene and what it means. Quote, when you wash your hands, you may not know precisely which germ you are avoiding. You just know that hand washing is good prevention for a variety of germs, especially but not only during a pandemic. Hygiene measures can be tedious. Their benefits are not directly visible. You might never know what problem they prevented from occurring. Conversely, when problems do arise, they may not be traceable to a specific breakdown in hygiene observed. For these reasons, hand washing compliance is difficult to enforce, even among healthcare professionals, who are well aware of its importance. End quote. Medical hygiene is not about the skillful use of the treatments that doctors only become qualified to provide after many years of study. Everyone in the medical context, including the nurse, the administrator, and the janitor, needs to shape their behavior to conform to hygienic practices in order for medical institutions to be as effective as we expect them to be and enable medical interventions to have the best chance of success. We collectively expect a medical culture to normalize hygienic practices because of the immoral implications of failing to do so, as demonstrated by how much death and suffering were inflicted by the medical profession in the era before germ theory replaced miasma theory as an institutional norm. We need an equivalent in schools. We need to create a culture that normalizes educational hygiene. The majority of the errors that schools make are at least partly attributable to the effects of demotivation and disengagement. The biases that are at the top of many people's minds these days, race, gender, disability, etc., are concerning because on occasions when they don't remove a student from learning opportunities altogether, they often result in demotivation and disengagement. When they are demotivated or disengaged, even if the children are physically present for the lesson, their learning will be shallow at best. Shallow learning in school is not acceptable in today's complex world, since it is a waste of everyone's time and energy. The most thoroughly supported model of human motivation and engagement in the world today is self-determination theory, as I've mentioned before. From this perspective, we know that psychological well-being, motivation, and engagement are the result of the satisfaction of the primary psychological needs for sleep, relatedness, autonomy, and competence. Educational hygiene, therefore, consists of practices that better support primary needs. Educational hygiene is not about the skillful use of instructional techniques that teachers only become qualified to provide after many years of study. Everyone in the educational context, including the student, the teacher, the administrator, the janitor, etc., needs to shape their behavior to conform to hygienic practices in order for educational institutions to be as effective as we expect them to be and enable educational interventions to have the best chance of success. We, collectively, should expect a school culture to normalize educationally hygienic practices. The immoral implications of failing to do so have been demonstrated by the rampant epidemic of disengagement. I will now paraphrase Kahneman et al. by adapting their statements to the context of educational hygiene. Just like hand washing and other forms of prevention, Educational hygiene is invaluable but thankless. Correcting a well-identified bias, such as race, gender, disability, etc., may at least give you a tangible sense of achieving something, but the procedures that systematically support primary needs may not. They will prevent demotivation and disengagement to some degree, yet you will never know when or how. Demotivation and disengagement are invisible enemies, and preventing the assault of invisible enemies can only yield an invisible victory. Hand washing does not prevent all diseases. Likewise, educational hygiene will not prevent all demotivation and disengagement. It will not make every student or teacher brilliant. But like hand washing, it addresses an invisible yet pervasive and damaging problem. 
Wherever there is a situation that meaningfully challenges a student or teacher, there is the possibility of demotivation and disengagement. And I, John Berg, propose educational hygiene as a tool to reduce it. End paraphrase. When you apply the list of behaviors that support primary psychological needs to your teaching practice, you will be starting down a more reliable path to equity. I am confident that this path is more reliable because it was developed from decades of scientific research showing that need-supportive behaviors provide benefits to every student, regardless of their personal, cultural, or situational circumstances. Practicing educational hygiene is similar to medical hygiene in that it is merely a starting point. In the same way that the medical community creates the best possible starting point for treatment by applying medical hygiene practices, when you practice educational hygiene, you may still have to follow up with the application of instructional expertise. The result of effectively and consistently teaching with equity in this way is that your pedagogy becomes catalytic, assuming you do not have counterproductive cultural baggage getting in the way. Being an educational catalyst means that you have become an effective facilitator of deeper learning in students. So, where does this put us? In my view, a holistic approach to education means embracing science as a holistic approach to the hidden causal structure of reality. Holism entails scientific humility about what we know and, more importantly, how much we don't know. A holistic approach to education means recognizing how central self-determination theory is to a scientific understanding of how learning is shaped by human nature, as minimally described by primary needs. In particular, it provides a method of meeting the critically important challenge of discerning educative from non-educative experiences as proposed by Dewey. The proper application of what we know about primary needs involves ensuring that all the humans in schools have those needs satisfied as leverage to produce the deeper learning we have always expected our schools to facilitate. School institutions can best achieve their educative goals by enabling members of each school community to accurately understand their situation and how to exercise their agency productively within that situation. Catalytic pedagogy is my term for the process of harnessing the leverage of human needs. It includes non-academic data sets that will enable school leaders to better manage the hidden curriculum, a topic I will discuss further in the next chapter. Holistic equity is a description of the results of achieving catalytic pedagogy. A holistic approach to education is a way of seeing education as a complex process embedded in several different levels of reality, also known as the human moral universe. It is not enough to think about the whole child, because the whole school, the whole society, and the whole planet also deserve our consideration. This concludes the sixth episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. If you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it will take to transform education systems around the globe, check out my other website, holisticequity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention.